Uh, my name is Sarah Wojcicki Jimenez, and I, I'm the state representative in the 99th district. I've been serving um, this district since uh, my appointment on November the 20th of 2015. And um, a little bit about my background: I grew up in Springfield, um, went to um, grade school and high school here, Cathedral and Ursuline Academy. I then went down to SIUE and got my bachelor's degree in mass communications and um, then I got my master's here in the 99th district at UIS in um, PAR which is public affairs reporting which is essentially uh, state government reporting. Um, from there I uh, my, my plan was to be a journalist and do that for my entire career. I was um, I, I was and I still think that that field is something that is of great importance in a, in a community and luckily through my time there I was able to cover a lot of the issues that affect residents here in the 99th district. I worked at TV stations in um, Quincy and Champaign but most of the time I was here at Channel 20 um, covering issues in and around the capital and in our community. So that gave me really good perspective um, for many years um, especially reporting in your hometown um, of developing relationships and contacts there and also really just learning more about um, the issues from lots of different angles here in our community. After that, I, um, my personality is one that is, you know, one I'm, I'm kind of like a fixer. So after a while in journalism, and I think I did some some good work, you know, uh, telling people's stories and communicating that to the community. But at the end of the day, when my time as a journalist, um, and I'm sure Doug remembers this, but um, I covered Governor George Ryan, a Republican, ended up going to prison. And then I covered Governor Rod Blagojevich, Democratic governor, ended up going to prison. That was also during the time where um, the pension payments were being skipped, the, balance, the budgets were still unbalanced, um, and it was quite a uh, fiasco, it seemed, every, every May down there. This has been happening for quite some time. And so at the end of the day, um, I, I got the opportunity to work inside state government, and I was able to work for um, many great people um, within state government and, and do their communications and <laughs> Um, work on those uh, issues for them, kind of communicating different issues. I worked in the executive branch and also the legislative branch and um, was able to really learn a lot from the inside of state government and um, saw a lot of things inside too that I thought could be improved along the way and I would make those suggestions to my bosses at the time. Um, also during that time I decided, you know, I think I want to get a little bit more involved in my community and so I ended up running for the Springfield Park District Board and won and served one term there. Um, during my time there, like a lot of local governments and state governments, there was some financial challenges and I felt like we really worked together in a, in a good way. It's, it's, a, it's a board where you don't identify if you're a Republican or Democrat, but there is a mix there, and I think that we worked pretty well together. And we had to make some some hard decisions in terms of uh, cuts and um, uh, looking at different fees and that sort of thing in that time to kind of write put put the park district on a, on a little bit different path. So um, I ended up running for that. It was a great um, opportunity, and it was. I had a great experience, you know, it was a volunteer board. We didn't get paid for it, but you just kind of did it in addition to your, my regular work. I decided not to run for another term um, because also during that time I uh, found the love of my life in Jose Carlos and we were married. Um, <laughs> when I was on the park board, I also found out that I was pregnant with twins and had twins and um, had, had gotten a new job all within that time period. So I thought, you know, I probably need to kind of refocus. And I had told uh, the local folks who had, were encouraging me to run again that, you know, I, I, it was great 
public service. I thought the people at the Park District were wonderful and the board members, but really the only thing I would ever want to consider running for again would be a, a position as a member of the General Assembly. That's where I had spent um, most of my time as a staff member um, working for the House Republican Caucus. I just really enjoyed the Capitol. I enjoyed the House, um, all of the, the issues that we were trying to tackle. You know, I really believed in a lot of those things. And so the opportunity came that for me um, to apply for the vacancy left by Representative Raymond Poe when he was appointed to the Department of Ag Directorship. And so um, I, the Sangamon County Republicans um, had a committee and they, they chose me to fulfill his term. And I had to decide very quickly if I was going to run also for that position because it was right in the middle of the term. Um, I was appointed on November 20th. I had 10 days to turn in petitions to be on the ballot. So um, we did that and we were able to turn in more than triple the amount of um, petition signatures. And I've just been so grateful and blessed in terms of the community's support and helping me do this. Because really, it's not about me. It's not about the title or doing. It's really about serving the community. And it's it's lucky for us, I think, even in our title, that it's representative. And so I've, um, it's my job to, to represent our district as a whole. And um, I've, I've spent my last 11 months talking with as many people as I can in the district, either going door to door. I've talked to thousands of people that way. Um, continuing to go to community events. Jose and I have always sort of done that our whole life. But um, just making sure that I'm available and um, really getting a good sense of what um, the residents of the 99th district um, want. And so um, that leads me here to today. And um, I'm happy to talk about, I don't know if you want me to go through some of my priorities and accomplishments or if you just kind of want to talk, you know, ask me specifically questions or how we want to go from here. That's just kind of my bio stuff. But Why don't we start off with what would be your top, say, two or three issues, priorities you would focus on if you're reelected? Okay. So um, when I am at uh, talking to people in the community, I would say 99% of the time um, the folks who I talk to, who are the people I represent, want a full year budget, they want a balanced budget, and they want certainty over, um, you know, for that, for our community, um, which is obviously a priority I share. When I came in, um, we were halfway through a fiscal year, and there wasn't a budget, you know. And so right when I came in, I mean, we were trying to, I was really trying to push and build relationship and figure out how do we move this forward. The second thing most people talk to me about, which again I think fits right with my personality, is working together. You need to figure out a way to work together, no matter what party you come from, no matter what party the person I'm talking to affiliates with, they feel like we need to, to work together in a bipartisan way. And luckily, I mean, really, um, I believe that. I mean, I've seen it in action. I've done it myself and in some of my accomplishments because I know that the only way we move forward is in a bipartisan way in the House. I mean, for Republicans in the House, we need, right now, um, I know there's an election coming up, but right now, we need 13 Democrats to sign on to um, things that, that we'd like to get passed. And so part of what I've tried to do, really, from the very beginning, um, I helped found the Future Caucus, um, which is a caucus in the, in the um, I'm one of the, you know, what's the word, inaugural members, but it's, uh, it's a caucus of Republicans and Democrats under the age of approximately 40 um, who were kind of new to the legislature. We're coming in at a time where we know it's a crisis. We've not really seen the good times as people talk about, and so we want to try to f figure out issues that we can work together. Um, I've also worked together, you know, in a couple of 
of the bills that I've done, including a, a resolution that would do the study for state jobs back to Sangamon County, which is a priority of the mayor. Uh, Jim Langfelter, um, he testified on behalf of the bill. I reached out to him. I reached out to Senator Menar to make sure that, uh, or to ask him if he would sponsor it in the Senate, which he did. And I really, I thought that could be kind of a, uh, might be a little bit of a complicated bill because when you're talking about issues in the legislature, my study is trying to bring jobs back to the capital city in Sangamon County. You can imagine for people who live other places, they would say, well, why can't we have jobs here? Or the people in Chicago are like, wait a minute, we want to keep them here. And so you really have to, and I, and I talked to lots of people on both sides of the aisle, and we were, we were able to, to pass that unanimously both through both the House and the Senate. And so I've really tried to make it a priority to build some of these relationships and bridges because um, that's going to be the only path forward for our state. Um, and I think that those are kind of the main priorities. Um, and, and probably the third priority that I, and it's, I mean, it's right up there, but I don't want to rank them like that. But I think that um, education is another area that most people, that a lot of people will bring up as one of their top priorities. However, I think the, the budget and balancing the budget and certainty there, even for the folks who say education is their priority, they almost always say that too. So. Okay, so you brought up education is something that, you know, the people are talking to you about. And uh, we have a very inequitable system here. Yes. Do you have any thoughts or ideas of how we might... Uh, remedy that or any steps that would need to be taken? Yeah, so I um, I totally agree with you. This is something that has been discussed in the legislature from when I was a reporter to when I was on staff. I mean, this is something that, you know, depending on what zip code you live in depends on the amount of money that, it's, that, that goes to each student. And I think it's a very challenging issue because even like when I was talking briefly about the state jobs resolution you have people all over the state who in some areas they have all schools that there's lots of money spent per student and you're trying to have conversations about how do we divvy that up a little better so that um, the access to a, a great education is afforded to all kids, no matter where you live and whatever your zip code is. And there were some efforts this session to do that with Senator Menar. Actually, he, he was one of the first people I met with after the appointment because I wanted to get his perspective. I knew he had spent um, a good deal of time on the issue, and I wanted to try to figure out how could we move forward to make it more equitable. And in, and in our area, in the 99th district, and the school district that could benefit most from a reform would be District 186 because I have District 186, but I have several rural districts too. And so you can see why and when these bills come forward, somebody wins by millions of dollars and some of the school districts would lose and the charts would come out and, you know, all of a sudden as a representative of the whole area, you get bombarded by... Um, calls on both sides of the issue and in and for Senator Menard's bill unfortunately most of the school districts lost in that scenario plus it was a um, um, in in the 99th district plus it was just a very difficult time to be having that conversation when there was so much uncertainty over the budget overall um, and so I think now that um, we were able, as, as another sort of accomplishment since I'd been in, we were able to f um, put forth a funding bill for a full year, K through 12 education, put more money into education than we have in, in some time. I think that opens up the, the conversation a little easier because I think a lot of school districts were very, just very tentative because they didn't know if there'd be a budget at all. And so then they take a look at these numbers and they think, well, I, there's so much uncertainty, I'm just, I'm out 
for now. And I understood that anxiety over doing a reform and you don't have a budget at all. You know, it's, it's just sets up kind of a tough environment. But, but I'm happy to see that the commission was formed um, to study the issue and they're required, I think, to, to bring back a recommendation to the legislature early next year. And I really think the folks who are on that commission, Democrats and Republicans, I think this is an area where we can accomplish a great goal because, and this is what I tell um, when I talk to our superintendents in the area, other educators, teachers, I say, look, you know, we've got a big challenge over at the Capitol. I mean, in almost every category. But when it comes to education, you've had the legislature in a bipartisan way, almost unanimous, pass a budget for education. And for a full year, more money, this is the time. This is the time where you have the governor and leg this, this is an area of agreement, I think, where we can get there in a pretty quick way and it would be trans transformative for our state. You've mentioned the budget a lot and the uncertainty, the difficulty we had in even getting to a stopgap. Has the governor been right to tie the turnaround agenda to the passage of a budget? You know, there have been people like Governor Egger saying we need the budget and then we can focus on the turnaround agenda. Yeah, so I, um, when the governor first came in, you know, I wasn't in the legislature. I do not think that it is impossible to do reforms in the budget at the same time, if you are kind of thinking in a practical way. We've got very smart people at the Capitol. We are in session for, you know, a pretty solid five or six months out of the year. It shouldn't be something that um, is impossible. I mean, we can walk and chew gum at the same time. I think over time it proved that the Speaker wasn't, the Speaker Madigan, especially, wasn't interested in reform. And so when that dynamic seems seemed to be pretty evident that he wasn't even willing to put in a serious way some of these reforms in a substantive committee, I don't know that anybody really anticipated that because on paper we should be able to do three or four reforms and a budget and get on with our business. I mean, that doesn't seem like an extreme goal. But over time, the speaker just threw up a big stop sign. And so what I did, actually, it was late April or early May of this year, I met with the governor. And I said to him, look, I've studied the issues. I'm not with you on all of your reforms and your agenda. There are certain Many of them I agree with, and I think that we can get done. I agree with you. I, we were talking about it when I was on staff. A lot of these ideas are not new. This is something that's been talked about for years. I said, however, and I went through the list of things in Sangamon County that were having big trouble because we didn't have a budget. They weren't covered by consent decree. And I said, we need in our area some sort of certainty or appropriation for these folks. We shouldn't stop fighting on reforms, but right now we need to do that. And I didn't know if the governor, you know, the governor was cordial in the meeting and listened to everything I said. And I mean, I was going line by line. We owe CWLP X. We owe the hospitals X. We, the homeless shelter hasn't gotten paid and it's really not even a, a big amount, but they're not covered under the consent decree. The sexual assault center, you know, they haven't gotten their funding. This is a, a big problem for our area, and I, it's my opinion that we need to try to move something forward. The speaker is being clear that he is not interested in reform. We can't make him call a bill. We can keep encouraging it. We should keep pushing for reform. We got to keep working on building coalitions to get reform, but right now, we need to move something forward. So we ended the meeting. He didn't say yes or no or anything. And so I was thankful as we moved into May and June that we started work on a stopgap budget. Is it perfect? No. 
you know, but I do think it sets up a conversation now. Hopefully, I'd sent the governor and speaker letters um, in August to say we should be in session more often to talk about these issues. We shouldn't wait until mid-November. But um, I think it sets it up for a conversation now that we can do some of these reforms and the budget for the rest of the year and, quite frankly, start working on, on a plan for the next several years. Um, but it shouldn't be impossible. There is somebody in the House who is just not interested in reform. And that's a problem. Could so you walk us through which areas where you agree with the governor and the areas of disagreement? You said you don't agree with him on all of his points. Yes. So I think, um, you know, and it's my understanding that the turnaround agenda has um, moved. You know, at first it was a pretty lengthy list, and then it <coughs> been sort of whittled down. Um, I think in order for us to um, get the, sta the state back on track, there are several things we've, we've got to do. We've got to balance the budget, which we've already talked about. We've got to create a better environment for economic growth. And we've got to deal with um, this issue that, um, that is the perception of many, even sometimes when I talk to people, uh, that the politicians can't be trusted because they create things that are only you know, beneficial to them. Etc. And so, um, for the economic growth, every business that I talk to in Springfield, they're very concerned about the budget, but they're also concerned with workman's comp um, issues. We can do better on that issue. I've talked to um, several of the rank and file members, uh, uh, Democrats, and I think that we can get there on that. I don't think that's going to be um, that complicated. I think that the issue of um, redistricting. We already passed that through the House. For some reason, they didn't work on it in the Senate. We, we all know what happened at the Supreme Court for the Citizens Initiative. Um, I think term limits is something that would, would actually fly out of both chambers if it was allowed to be called for a vote. There's, there's no way that that wouldn't pass, and, that, and, and honestly, that it shouldn't pass. Um, I think that, that some of the issues that the governor refers to um, when it comes to some of the union issues um, are not ripe uh, for, for action right now. I think that, um, again, he should be allowed to talk about that mm -hmm. um, if he wants, but it's just my opinion as I'm looking at the reforms um, and the reform package and kind of what we need to do to move this thing forward is that some of those issues are probably not ripe at this time. And I think the other thing that he talks about is tort, tort reform as part of his five. I think we all know anything that you've read on that issue, people in Illinois venue shop, and um, this is an issue for sure in our state. I think that we should continue to work on that. Um, and try to find some common ground. Um, I think there, there, there could be common ground there. Um, but again, I think some of the, the political reforms um, and um, the other things I mentioned, we could move forward fairly quickly. And part of the process at the Capitol is trying to build on the thing you've done before. And I think we need to build some bridges um, on some of these areas. There's kind of a seems to be sort of this lack of trust. And we need not only sometimes with the community and the, the people who work at the Capitol, but also within the Capitol. And so that's why I've really tried to seek out um, people um, from the, the other political party to figure out what issues are of concern to them and um, try to work with them on those, even if that means that my party leadership or the governor is not for them. Because at the end of the day, we as the House, this is where it starts. You know, the governor can propose everything he wants and thinks it should be on the agenda. But we in the House have to, that's where the process starts. That's where the bills go. And that's where the bills move. And, and, and we've got to get together on that, those things. So what, what, I'm sorry, go ahead. So what, 
What I've heard you say is uh, you could probably see a group moving on redistricting on uh, term limits. And are there other reform things that would need to be part of the deal? I guess what I'm looking for is what's the deal? Yeah, I think workman's comp too. I think I know that a lot of the, the Democrat folks say that's just a non-starter. But as I talk to people and, and folks who, some of the other um, members of the General Assembly, even those who represent um, wherever they live, they also have businesses. Right. So I'm sure if they're talking to their business owners, they would have support for this type of reform. I just, I, I think if you really try to start to dive into that issue, I mean, and that doesn't matter if you're a for-profit business, a non-for-profit business, a government entity. All of these folks, if you really talk to them, if you talk to the leaders of the communities, they all say that this is, this is a problem and it's a strain on their budget. And so I just think on that particular issue, and I've talked to some folks in the business community about, you know, really trying to... Um, get together with some of some of the Dems because we need some some Democrats to support this type of initiative um, because that will cut down on business costs. I mean, in, in addition to you know some of these other kind of rules and um, regulations that they have to kind of go through with with government. But um, I think that 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 one along with the political reforms. And there are some other reforms that aren't, I don't think, like on his bulletin board of agenda, you know, his agenda, but in terms of procurement reform, I mean, you talk to anybody. I, I talk to, um, as I'm talking to people just in the community who work for the state, who part of their job is in purchasing, they will tell me, I mean, I have an example of a guy just right over here on the west side of Springfield who, who does some maintenance work on one of the buildings. And he said, I know that I could buy a part for a third of the cost, but I've got to jump through all these lo hoops and, and loops, and I'm paying three times as much as I could. And I know I've been working here for a while. I know where to go. And there are just um, some of these efficiency inefficiencies going on that we could do that's a reform because I think sometimes people look at reform as, oh, it's, it's just going to be, we're going to cut it off or we're going to, but reform really, in my opinion, is, is, is looking at a situation in a different way, still serving the people we need to serve, but it can save money. And it's not necessarily, um, you know, just cutting everyone off. So I've, I've heard the procurement thing, but uh -huh. what, what I don't understand is what what can the legislature do about that? I mean, it seems like this is a Republican executive mm -hmm. who's named the agency heads, and it seems to me that you could go out and say, you need to start saving money on light bulbs, you know, yeah. or whatever it is. Just get it done. Yeah, so it's my understanding that um, after – right after the Governor Bogoyevich was impeached, the legislature put in some pretty strict rules as sort of a reaction to some of the things that were being accused, <coughs> accused in some of the agencies when it comes to purchasing. And so they put in kind of all these layers that someone has to go through in state statute. And so that's why the legislature needs to go back into state statute and say, okay, how about we, you know, I don't want to say loosen up because that, you know, maybe portrayed the wrong way, but just make it e easier for um, that process to go through rather than, because a lot of times, and I understand probably what the intent was during that time. I mean, what a, what a horrible, horrifying um, moment in our state's history. The legislature was, you know, trying to look at everything, to tighten everything up as, as much as possible. But I think what had occurred and what we've studied in um, the procurement reform is that it tightened up so much that now we're spending, they estimate, $500 million more per year than we may need to in that area. 
One thing that's become a big issue in this race is the votes on the issue of the union contract and arbitration. Can you um, explain for us how you've come to, you know, you voted with the governor on these issues. Can you discuss what played into your decision and why you voted that way? Sure. And, you know, this um, kind of goes to some of the very challenging things that we are facing at the Capitol. Um, and for me, my premise right now in a financial crisis, let's, you know, we remember that most people that I talk to want a balanced budget. They want us to pay down our bill backlog and get us on a path to certainty. That particular bill um, was a bill that came forth. Um, and every time a bill comes before me, I say, one of the questions is, how much does this bill cost? or how much could it cost um, if we approve it. And on that particular bill, the administration was claiming that it would cost $3 billion. Now, I talked with the union folks several times, and I and because they disputed that number. They said, no way. That could, you know, that's impossible. It couldn't be $3 billion. And they said, okay, well, this is very important to me because we have a bill backlog right now and at the time it was a little less but it's nearing nine billion dollars we are through the court consent decrees we're spending more money through those than we probably can afford so if the administration is claiming this costs three billion dollars and it doesn't tell me what the figure is because the way that the arbitration would go is the arbitrator uh, would come in and he or she or the team would pick one proposal or the other, one proposal or the other. They can't say, let's meet somewhere in the middle. That's not how, how it works. And so I could never get a figure from uh, the union leadership in terms of how much their proposal would cost because we're thinking about the legislature shouldn't be in this process, right? This should be handled at the negotiating table between the administration and the union, and they should come to an agreement. That's how this should work. But they filed a bill about, I think it was about one month after the, the negotiation had originally started, and they wanted to basically take the governor and themselves out of the, the process and kick it to the, to the arbitrator. And my concern was, and I continued to, to tell everyone who would talk to me about it is, we can't, when you're in a financial crisis, it, it should, we should not kick it to a person who's going to make a financial decision, ultimately, on a contract that would probably be very difficult to afford. I mean, we've got all of these other um, crises happening. And so that's, that is why, ultimately, I voted no on the bill. But I'm very supportive. You know, I've, I've met with the union folks every time they want to meet coming into my office. You know, I want to, I used to be a state worker myself. My husband works for the state in, in the Department on Aging. I mean, I am going to be as supportive as I can of state state workers. It's, a, it's an important part of our city and our county and the economy. And But what I'm not going to do is over-promise and under-deliver. That's part of the reason we're here. And so I want to make sure that people know that. And I'll run through kind of the list that I ran through with the governor in terms of the hospitals aren't getting paid. We're behind in these bills and this bill and that bill. and you know, we're not paying people for six months or nine months or a year, you know, whatever the bill cycle is at the time. And we have all, we're all in the same boat. And we want to get, I think, on a better path because when I talk to folks um, in the state workforce, um, they want certainty. You know, that's the biggest thing they want. And I want to try to push for that too. Unfortunately, we are in a financial crisis. And we just have to be very cognizant of that as we vote on bills in the legislature. So one big part of, of the budget is the, the state pensions. Mm -hmm. How do we address those, both where we're at now and where we're at? That is a very, very difficult 
question, and this is one that um, the legislature and the, even the former administrations have, had been trying to work on for years. You know, the Supreme Court ruled on the bill that was passed a couple of years ago that basically indicated that, you know, the, the benefit cannot be diminished, as the Constitution says. And so my position on this is I talk to the union groups and um, state workers at the door, other people in the medical community who have their certain opinions on state pensions. I say, how are we going to address this issue together? Because we know that the pension fund is the worst funded pension fund in the country. It's at, you know, nearing $115 billion. How are we going to address this together? Because if we don't do it together, then there will be a lawsuit. It'll probably go to the Supreme Court again. And, I mean, they were pretty clear in their decision. And so what I'm trying to do on this issue and many others, even when people keep telling me, no, no, we're not for reform, or, you know, the Supreme Court says this, so we're not going to be there. I, I take that as a not yet because I will not accept the premise that people can just stand on the sidelines during a, a crisis. So I'm going to continue to work with them, I think. Um, but I do think it would be very difficult, given the Supreme Court ruling, to um, reform current pension benefits or, you know, current employee pension benefits or retirees. I mean, I think the Supreme Court's been pr pretty clear on that. So I think, again, we probably should work toward um, maybe a tier three, looking at what that might look like and potential savings there. Um, but in the meantime, see if there is any room um, with the unions and the, the state workforce to look at any other changes that they could agree to. Because if they don't agree to it, then I think we're going down this other path again, um, which both sides, the state and the unions, are going to spend a lot of money um, to achieve probably a similar result. So has anybody talked about changing the angle of the ramp? You know, that's always talked about, I think, because um, and that was a big thing that happened, I think, in the mid-'90s with the pension fund. I mean, this has been a... This is, the pension fund has been an issue of conversation for a long, long time. I don't think that that's something we should look to first. Um, I haven't had a, um, a lot of conversations about that because I think it's we've got to figure out if there are things that we can do within the system or changing the system going forward first. But when you look at benefits, the Tier 2 thing really just, I mean, I'm... Frankly, I'm not sure why people get into state government. They sure don't do it for the pension anymore, mm -hmm. you know. And with the reduced workforce and everything else, those are tough old jobs. Yeah. So I'm just not sure that thinking that we could balance the pension <coughs> by further reducing benefits is is going to get out there very much. It's not going to happen very much. Yeah, I mean, I think this is a topic that will be discussed at length. You know, I think there, even the governor had had talked about the Senate president's plan, which would offer a choice for current employees. I'm not sure that that one passes muster, um, but constitutionally correct. And President Cullerton, for some reason, isn't even hasn't even really put it back on the table, even though you know, they've kind of talked about it, and I'm not sure right. why. That Supreme Court decision was fairly <laughs> it, it was fairly clear, <laughs> yeah. yes. So that, that may be part of it. So what about, what about revenue? So um, that's an area that's uh, a very, it's a very tough, issue, right? Because I, as I talk to people in our area, um, they know that we've got to do something more with cuts and reforms and efficiencies first. They say that, I believe that, 
I've, I've lived that in my other jobs. We've got this issue right now in the um, House, particularly, where the speaker isn't interested in moving forward on any of the things we've discussed today. It doesn't seem to be. Um, and that's a big problem, because I see it as if you raise revenue right now, we have a well that everyone knows. The constituents I talk to, you guys know. Everybody knows we need reform. If you raise revenue and start just dumping it into this well that we know has a lot of cracks, we're going to be in this situation again. You can't raise revenue right now enough that will um, take care of the problem. I mean, it just wouldn't be an acceptable rate. It's my understanding for every quarter of a percent you raise the income tax, for example, you bring in a billion dollars. So you look at the bill backlog, you look at some of the spending deficits, and you're going to get to a pretty high tax rate. And people are on the verge, even in our community. I'm, I'm telling you, you know, when I talk to moms and dads at the door, they're nervous about their taxes going up. Some of them complain about their property tax. They're nervous about the unbalanced budget, about their kids. You know, either that they don't think there are going to be opportunities for their kids. They think um, in some of the areas, especially for folks who don't work um, in state government necessarily in our community, who work in the medical district, which is actually our lar largest um, uh, point of employment in Sangamon County, is, is the growing medical district. And those people, house after house after house, tell me they're not from here. And they're considering moving. I mean, and that's not a, and I've been actually, I mean, I've read all the reports about that, but I am seeing that in our own community. And for me, I love this community. I grew up here. My f parents live here. My husband's parents live here. I love it, and I know we can do better. And I'm willing to, to fight for that and to get in there and fight for it. But, I mean, when you read these reports and you hear these conversations at the door, people are leaving. I just knocked on a door in um, Auburn. A young couple had a for sale sign in their yard. And um, I said, oh, you know, I didn't know if they were moving soon, you know, before the election or not. And she said, oh, no, we're, we're moving to Missouri. The taxes are better over there. There's more opportunities. My husband's a, um, an auctioneer. We just don't have any opportunities here, so we're, we're going to leave. And I hear that story. I mean, that is not an uncommon story, it's, you know, especially with the for sale sign in their yard. So we have got to do um, things that are in a balanced way. You can't just go to revenue and not do some of these other things. Otherwise, we're, we're going to just keep going down the same path and keep going to revenue. And I think the, the big complication we have is um, that there's a big stop sign when it comes to reform in the House. And that's just not acceptable because if you're talking to anybody in the business community, just regular people, they know, and I know, we need to, to make some changes. Real yeah. quickly, because we're about out of time, okay. um, what areas would you look at for cuts? You know, you know, we've mentioned efficiencies too, but I think most people are of the opinion you can't get there solely on efficiencies. Sure. Yeah, so I think there are, again, and this kind of goes back to, to the issue we're having with being having things be able to move forward in the House. But and, and I know everybody brings it up, but I've worked in both places, in the Treasurer and Comptroller's Office. I think there can be a combination there. I think both constitutional officers have agreed. Um, I've worked in both places. There are certainly some efficiencies there. Um, I think we talked about a little bit before procurement reform. That could be uh, a substantial savings. Um, and I think some of this is underway already, um, but in upgrading the technology um, with the state, there are going to be just natural efficiencies there and savings um, through that. 
I think as we look at pension reform, even if it's prospective, there will be savings there. Um, and even something as, as simple but very important to our community on getting us on a path to um, fill va vacancies and having state the state workforce be m more centralized here in the capital city. As I look at figures on that, um, I talked to the comptroller's office and over a five year span, um, it was more than $100 million is spent on travel, you know, for state workers going from place to place. Now, I don't want to go to the extreme and say, we have a very, very large state, so people are going to have to travel in order to, to deliver services. But that's just another example of, you know, now's the time to make those types of moves because um, it would it would be good for our, our local economy, but it could also save on things like mileage and hotels and that sort of thing as we put ourselves on that that path. Can I ask one more question? One more. <laughs> okay, so you <laughs> admitted there's lots of difficult things ahead. Mm -hmm. You've got lots of difficult things, and you know the voters are very dissatisfied. You said that repeatedly. Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? Do you see a light at the end of the tunnel? What is it? I do, because I couldn't do this if I didn't. I mean, it's a this is a, a, a job and a position where I didn't create one piece of the mess in each of these categories. But I believe in our community, in our city, in the leadership that I have. I am hopeful because I've met and I'm really trying to form relationships with um, um, some of the kind of newer, younger Democrats coming in. And we are all coming in at a time where the crisis is enormous. But what I, hope, what I hope and what I see is that for those of us who are coming in right now, I think I have a pretty good um, breadth of the, the situation. I'm not an expert. I'm still learning. But if we're coming into this right now, it's not for the accolades. It's not for people think, oh, attaboy. You know, you're at a boy, had a girl. Um, it's because I believe we see the problem. We want to stay here. I don't want to be one of those people or one of those families moving out of the state. So when people tell me that they're hopeless, I say, please don't say that. Because I'm in there every day trying to figure out, if not plan A, what's plan B. And that's just my personality. I'm not willing to give up on the state. And now I'm in the arena. And I, I truly believe that um, if folks will give me an opportunity to serve um, another term, at least, um, I will continue to do that. I will continue to um, build relationships, you know, and um, do things like, which I forgot to mention earlier, um, the issue of the state museum. When I first came into office, I was very vocal that that was a mistake. And I tried to do everything I can. I filed legislation. It couldn't get out of the Rules Committee. I talked to people in the other chamber. I said, well, can, maybe could you move it, you know? <laughs> um, how can we get this moving to come to a compromise? And ultimately, on that issue, I had a very uh, stern conversation with the administration. And I said, if we don't open this museum up by this summer, we could lose accreditation. We've already lost staff. We have got, you've got to give me a date when this thing's going to be open. And there was another process by which they were moving some, some of the rules through um, JCAR. And I said, we have got to do this. I mean, this is, I know, we've got lots of crises everywhere. But this is a state museum, and it's got our state treasures. And we have got to do that. And I think anybody who's known me for, whether it's my jobs or the people or my friends uh, growing up, they know that I'm going to stand up for what's right for our community with the premise that our, you know, our, our, our finances are our biggest challenge right now. But I'm going to do that, and I want to move our community forward. I think that. Any, I don't care if it's 
the leader of the um, House Republicans, or even the governor, as I've described today, I will stand up to them and say, this is the path I believe we need to be on. And I hope that um, people will consider giving me another opportunity for another term.